so I got up today at three in the morning. Uh, I slept 11 hours. I set an alarm with good intentions at like three o'clock and I was like, I'm only gonna sleep for two hours. My alarm goes off at five, I pass out, get up at seven, pass out again, and I just ended up sleeping the whole night through. So uh, I'm up now, it's like 6 a.m. in Hong Kong. I'm going to take this ferry to Lama Island, which is supposed to be beautiful. It's a 20 minute ferry ride away from Hong Kong Central, and you can see some old fishing villages and a beautiful walk. So I'll take you guys around there. Then I'm gonna meet up with my client again, and we're working on some intense hand ranges and preflop strategy today. So I'll show you guys a little bit of what we are up to as well. Let's go. Looks like I'm absolutely the only one on this ferry. And one of the things I love doing when I go to a new city is getting up early to explore the city because it's always quiet, whether I'm in New York or Hong Kong or Milan. Whenever I'm jet lagged, being up at 5 a.m. and walking outside in the city is a great way to have it all to yourself and feel like you have a little bit of calm in the midst of the madness. So we're back at the Mandarin. What are we working on today? Some hand history and uh, pre-flop strategies. Awesome, let's crush it. Yeah. So this is a hand I was telling you about earlier where like what you're gonna do is depending on who the button is. Like do you wanna play the hand against the button? That would indicate I three bet. And again, my sizing would be bigger like we talked about. Yeah. It would be like 1800. Because making it 1500 makes the three bet go from profitable to non-profitable because he's gonna call you in position. Right, right. So I would, three, if the button is the fish and I want to play the pot against him, I'll three bet and I'll make it a big enough size that I give myself two chances to win the pot. One is by him folding, the other is by taking the lead and winning the pot post swap yep. with a C bet. If the straddle is the fish, I'll flat call and let the straddle stay in the pot and then I'll lead if I make a strong hand to force the straddle in the pot and get the button to fold. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, so we're just wrapping up our day session here at the Mandarin. Uh, Horace, what did you think about today and yesterday working together? It's a very, very nice day and productive day to me. And uh, we've been talking about life, uh, planning, and uh, we have discussed the strategies on poker, pre flop strategies, yep. post flop strategies, and uh, I like try to find a lot of. Yeah, I try to find some potential leads that I have, yep. and we uh, fix it. Yeah, so that's awesome. uh, pretty productive. That's awesome. Yeah, cool. So what, what are you going to implement into your game when you go to your next session? Yeah, I'm going to play tighter because my range is kind of way too loose. Yep. As Alex says, so I think I'll probably save, save some money and increase my win rate. That's awesome. I'm yeah. looking forward to it. Keep us posted and right. thanks for your time today. Sure, thank you awesome. very much. One of the focuses of our session are answering, of course, a lot of the questions that he has. So we decided to film this video and answer them for you as well so you guys could benefit from some of the strategy that we're doing here together. Yeah. So what is your question? And I will answer it in the video. Yeah, okay, my question is like, shall we like sea betting every dry pool? Okay. Yeah. So general sea betting strategy? Or? Yeah, general sea Right. Sea betting when we're the pre-flop raiser. We are the pre-flop raiser. Yeah. Okay, in a single raised pot. Single raised pot. How about what, what kind of adjustments we like make between in position and out position? Okay, awesome question. This is a great question by Horace, and so many of you have this question, and it is such a fundamental part to our game. Now, I want to preface this answer by saying that I can't cover everything about sea betting strategy in this video, and making generic statements don't always apply. So if you're a skeptic out there watching, there will always, you're right, there will always be situations where the advice I'm giving doesn't make sense and you have to deviate from it because it's just simply such a big concept that you can't possibly have a simple answer that applies holistically to everything. It's kind of like saying, you know, what's the best way to develop my pieces in chess? It's like, well, you're generally supposed to do these things, but there are times when you do totally different things because the way your opponent is playing or their strategy or the game. So anyway, you get the point. But Horace's question specifically was, should we always be c-betting on dry boards? Now, wet boards are totally different. It's almost a subject for a separate video, but on dry boards as the preflop raiser, it's generally a good spot to c-bet because there aren't a lot of hands that your opponent could call with. What is a dry board? Well, an example of that would be something like king seven deuce. If you're the preflop raiser, this is a great textured board to continuation bet because it's unlikely your opponent 
can call you unless they have something like a king or a seven, and there aren't that many possibilities of those hands, there's much more air that your opponent can have, therefore he's likely to check fold. Now if you're taking this a level further, you can say, well, Alec, it's true your opponent doesn't have those hands, but it's also true that you don't have those hands. So if you're c-betting too often on these boards against, against good observant opponents, then what's going to happen? Your range is going to be too much comprised of air, and your opponents can start floating you or check raise bluffing you and putting you to the test. Then you could kind of take this a level further and go, he said, she said, he said, she said, and then you should generally deviate back towards a game theory approach. Now you're only going to go to a game theory approach and create a really balanced range on the flop against good observant players whom it matters against. So you might want to consider checking back against better players with hands that have some showdown value and therefore protect your checking range the times that you do have air and then only bet with some hands that are like backdoor draws that you can bluff with, something like 8-9 suited on king-7 deuce. You can bet on a 10, a jack, a 6, or if you pick up a diamond, you can continue barreling. And then you also want to bet for value with your nutted hands, like king-queen or better, to get value on three streets. That's a simple way to construct a c-betting range against better players. That's more of a game theory approach, and I generally recommend a, a, applying that strategy when you don't know who you're playing against. If you're playing online poker or you just sit down at a table and you see some young guy and you don't really know what his strategy is, he's probably going to play pretty well. I would generally use a GTO strategy and just start playing a, hand, a, a way that is following theory. In chess, it would be tantamount to opening your e4 pawn. You're just going to do what is generally the right strategy because that's a, a winning play regardless of how your opponent reacts. Then if you notice that your opponents are folding too often, they're not floating you, or that you can get them to fold on multiple streets by barreling multiple times, I might increase my c-betting frequency, especially on these dry textured boards. On these types of dry boards, as far as c-betting strategy goes, you're generally going to be wanting to bet a third or half of the pot, and the reason is because there aren't that many hands that you have that connected with this board, and there also aren't that many hands that your opponent has that connected with this board. Therefore, there's really no reason to bet pot or three-fourths pot because it accomplishes the same thing as betting a third of the pot. Betting smaller allows your range to be wider, which allows you to bet profitably with more hands, and it also increases your, your risk reward is therefore better. In other words, you're risking less money to win the pot, so it makes your bet overall more profitable. That's my generic tips on c-betting strategy. Of course, there's much more to go into, much more than I could go into in this video. Uh, if you want more from me, subscribe to ConsciousPoker.com. I share a lot more of my insights and strategies into how I construct ranges, how I put opponents on hand, and how I generally think about the game of poker. It's absolutely free, and it's available to you because some of our best content is over there. If you want more travel vlogs and updates about Hong Kong and Macau, playing and coaching high stake poker out here. Subscribe to my YouTube channel because more awesome content is coming your way in the next week. And I'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching. Most importantly, actually I almost forgot, leave your thoughts in the comment below. Let me know your thoughts on c-betting strategy because I actually learned a lot from you guys as well. And I know that if I'm learning a lot, the whole community is learning a lot as well. So your opinion matters. Please leave your, please leave your thoughts in the comment below and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.